Hey everyone, my name is Frederick Jansen. I'm the director of the Software and Application Innovation Lab at Boston University, and I'm also CTO of Things Party, which is a startup in the UTC space. My talk today will be on building and deploying privacy preserving data analysis platform, which happens to own the web. For those of you who do not know, MTC or Secure Multi Party Computation is a subfield of cryptography, of cryptography which allows you to compute a function on private inputs without revealing those inputs. You can really perform any computation, and there is no guarantee that your public output has no inference to your private inputs. So it's a really powerful technology, but at the same time, unlike, for example, differential privacy, which also exists in the same space of privacy enhancing technologies, it does not guarantee row level anonymity, for example. And you know, there are other tools and technologies that I would, would consider to be complementary to MPC in the space of privacy enhancing technologies. We've been really fortunate to be able to work mostly on social good applications in the space. Our first project, and the one that I'll mainly be referencing in this talk, is, is the one for the Boston News Workforce Council, which has to do with data free. We've also deployed the same platform for the Greater Boston Chamber of Commerce for economic inclusion, but we've worked on other projects in the UTC space, including working with startups like HRLE on um, opioid addiction or combating opioid addiction, and Project Callisto, which was a project for detecting zero perpetrators of sexual misconduct. We're currently working with a local startup on bank fraud protection to allow banks to use private sending recession to be able to share certain bits and pieces of information on suspected, suspected bank frauders. Maybe a little bit of the history of MPC. It was discovered in the late 1970s and early 1980s, or it was at least published first in right in that time frame. And then it took about 30 years before the first real deployment happened. So we're talking 2008, the very famous sugar beets auction, or in Spain's in, in the MPC space. And then nothing happened for a couple of years in 2014. This might be a deployment, this might be a simulation, depends on how you look at it. But then there's a string of deployments that, that my very small team is responsible for. So we've deployed the, the web based platform almost a dozen times right now. And we're very proud of the work that we've done. But at the same time, it is somewhat sad and, and telling of, of the industry that it took so long and that there are so few deployments of MPC. Um, I think it's kind of, you know, maybe as this, as this talk will show, my sense is that a lot of it has to do with, with accessibility and, and making sure that you build tools that are actually usable for people. At some point, we were responsible for, I would imagine, more than half of the worldwide MPC deployments. One notable exception here is 2017, Google launched predictive typing on Android and uses MPC for secure aggregation. Luckily now, however, the landscape is a little bit different. There seems to be a lot more traction around MPC. These are some of the logos of the MPC Alliance members. And so these are all folks who are either using MPC or are developing products in the MPC space. So hopefully this traction lasts because I do believe that it is a very powerful and promising technology. Maybe set on the stage a little bit for the platform that we built. So back in the early 2010s, Mayor Minio in Boston came up with, with an idea to make the Greater Boston area the premier place for working women in America. And one of the pillars of, of this project was closing the wage gap. In order to do so, he needed to, to be able to measure the wage gap and then see if the programs that were enacted actually helped close the wage gap. And for that to happen, you need to be able to collect this kind of data. So they ran into a snag not so long after for two reasons. One, the trusted third party that they identified backed out and said, you know, collecting all of this data in the clear is just a legal liability. And if something happens, if this data leaks, you don't want to get sued. And the members who are participating in this program said, well, this is proprietary information. We don't really want to share this data with anyone else. We're happy to you know, participate in, in this kind of computation, but we don't really want to, we don't really want to send our individual data to, to anyone. So my boss at the time, Professor Pistavros, he knew of MPC as something that he'd learned about back in, back in his college days. And he thought that this could, could be a, a viable solution to, to solve this problem. So we've identified MPC as a potential solution, but now the next challenge is how do we convince people that it actually is something that they want to participate in? 
And this is half of our data. You know, we have hundreds of participants who will be submitting their data or participating in this computation, and we want to make sure that they can do so securely, but we also want to make sure that they understand what they're getting into. And really, the issue here is you claim that there's this magical solution called MTC that you can use to, to compute over private data, but people don't have the intuition like they might have with a little, you know, browser icon lock that this page is secure. You know, the MTC is, is still novel enough that people think, is this even possible? Are you selling me snake oil? And people ask, you know, is this really access control? Are you telling me that you won't look at the data, that you actually can look at the data? Or is this encryption at rest where the data is encrypted most of the time, but when you actually compute on it, obviously you have to encrypt it, right? How, how else can you, can you compute on the data? Or what happens if this data leaks? What happens if you, if you get breached? What's the, you know, potential for bad press? What's the cost of us to, to participate in, in this kind of, um, a computation? So it's not really technical and, you know, we don't have the budget to do so. So those is, those are one set of questions. The second set of questions that we get is, or that we received was, can I actually participate? You know, maybe my data is encumbered by HIPAA, maybe I'm a government organization and I don't want to deploy it for, for any of this data. What's the legal liability involved? Which lawyer should I get into the room and what kind of EPA do we have to sign if I didn't have send you any data? And so these are all questions that we answer in any sort of communication effort that we have. But we also try to give people an intuition of how MPC works itself so that they feel like this is a safe and secure application. So one of the first efforts of, of doing so is the following. We tell people, you know, you have your data, you have $10, you want to compute the, the aggregate of everyone's data. So what you do is you split your data into two parts. The size of this bar chart um, corresponds to the, the size of the data. And you send one share to one party and the other share to the other party. They have their local shares. They do the sum of the, the sum of the shares and you end up with the total of all the participants without having to send the data to anyone. And this worked well for a while until someone remarked, are you leaking the lower bound of, of the data? You know, I send you five. I know that the data is never going to, that my real number is never going to be lower than five. When we said, you know, this is a, their point. It's not actually the solution that we that we would be running, but we didn't want to get into into the risk of trying to explain financial algorithms to people and, and make it more complicated than it needs to be. But we thought, you know, maybe it's worth it. Let's let's try to find an analogy that people should know of in the real world. And try to see if we can explain financial algorithms to them. So we came up with clocks. You know, clocks roll around. You can add nine to twelve, then you end up with nine again. So this allows people to do the same kind of math, but then using clocks. And we thought this was a good analogy, and for the most part, I think it was okay. But what ended up happening was, even though the math works out, people seem to have trouble making the connection between clocks and how it really identifies back to their data. And even, you know, even though the math works, they didn't really seem to have this intuition of how it works and end up with more questions than actually the previous example. So in, in the third and final example, which is what we mainly use these days, we, we, we get around this issue by just introducing negative numbers. So we have your actual data, and then we have a random number that you generate, which we call the mask. This can be positive, this can be negative. The size of these bar charts no longer corresponds to the value of the data, minus three. I mean, you can't really represent minus space in, in this example, but we do it this way. So you send the mask to one party, you send the mask data to the other party, and if you have everything all together, the um, masks cancel out, and then you end up with um, with a total here as you would in the first example. And this works very well. People people don't seem to be questioning this, and they seem to have an intuition of how you can compute that over data that you don't actually have, or that you know, seemingly random when you do have it. This is a protocol diagram which we show to people just, you know, the way the servers are set up, we are Boston University in this case, this is the data we receive, this is the data that Boston University would first console will receive. Some other considerations, we only explain adequacy for sharing, typically, even though while we did use this initially for the first couple of deployments, we no longer do, we switch to sharing secret sharing, but we don't actually, for the most part, explain sharing secret sharing or any of the more complicated protocols, but we do tell people 
you know, let's extrapolate from here. Like I've shown you how to do addition. Then imagine that you can also do there's a more complicated way of doing multiplication and basically any computation. And for the most part, people trust this please. For those who don't, we point to some of our larger members, State Street, Partners Healthcare, Boston University, and MIT, who have signed up, who have signed on to to be participants. And we say, you know, maybe not trust us, but hopefully you'll trust them, which also seems to work very well. So like I mentioned, we do have other variants of presentations, including engineers and sharing, which we really limit to specific audiences and specific use cases, like for example, with Project Callisto, which really revolve, revolves around engineers and sharing. So we don't typically show this to um, let's say C C level managers. Another example that we use, which is more of an informal example or, or when it's an in-person setting, we use birthdays. So imagine that you have a bunch of people in the room and you tell them, come up with, with your, think about your age, but lie about it and tell your neighbor what your fake age is. And remember by how much you lied about your age. And then you kind of do this round robin protocol where everyone whispers the name or whispers their fake age into the ear of, of the next person and adds it up to, to their own fake age and then around the circle. And then the second time, you subtract on how much you lied about your age. And if you do this two times, then you end up with a total of everyone's age without ever having to reveal their actual ages. And it seems to resonate well with people who understand how that protocol works. You can do it with your kids, and it's really easy. We do have a lot of training sessions and hand handouts for data submission, just because we've learned in a very painful way, which I'll talk about later as well, that it's a lot easier to spend a couple of hours up front than it is to have to recover from any data mistakes or entry mistakes under it. It's possible, but it's painful. And then finally, something that we mostly started with at the start, it's a little verbiage that's typical in web development, but maybe in other places as well, it doesn't really work as well for MTC. Like we used to say, upload your spreadsheet until someone commented, I thought I wasn't uploading my data, I thought it remained private and secure. And we said, oh, you're, you're technically not uploading it. But you're participating in this computation and you're, you know, everything happens in the browser, everything happens locally, so we never really see your data. So we have to switch some of the verbiage to to make sure it aligns more with MPC, even though it's not perfect and there's still words that you know are, are hard to change just because that's what people are used to, like the button is submit. So we've we've gotten this far. People seem to understand MPC. Now it's a question of building something that they can actually use. And we decided to, to build a custom solution, not necessarily initially by choice, but just because we thought it was the best way of moving forward. Actually, initially, we wanted to speak with with a vendor in this space who had a commercial solution, and we told them what we wanted to do. And they said, oh, we have the perfect product for you. We will give you a VM. You add your algorithm to it. We send it to your participants. They install it in your cloud environment. They link it to their data storage. They open up some ports in their firewall, and then when everyone's ready, you flip the switch, they all participate in your computation, they'll be really fast, and you'll get your result. And we said, you know, this sounds great, but I don't think it's going to work, because we have banks and hospitals that are participating, and they're not going to want to install binaries onto their cloud environments. Um, you know, we, we want something that probably just works on the web, because the other part of our participants are startups, and, and they don't even have a cloud. You know, they, they would never be able to install a VM. They don't have an IT department. And and they said, well, you know, that's not really that's not really what we do, and we don't think that MTC on the web is, is a good idea in the first place. And I understand why it doesn't work for their business model, but at the same time, going back to why hasn't MTC been deployed, I think it's exactly this, right? It's it's because solutions have been built that might work in a business to business setting, but you know, we'll never get traction if you want to work with 140 separate businesses at the same time that all want to participate in your computation. So we built our, our own web-based platform. Version one arguably was not very great, it worked for the most part, but it had problems with data validation, which I'll talk about later. We ended up with version three at this point, which really has been user tested. We've done user studies using hands on we've done A-B testing. We've tried to make it as seamless as possible where people only have to click a link, drag and drop in their spreadsheet, and that's it. It's submit and they participate in their computation. It has extensive error checking and validation on the 
front end, just because we notice it's really easy to fat finger a number. Maybe they report, you know, they add an extra zero to their data. And because it's MEC, it's really it's possible, but it's really difficult to discover and, and recover um, from these kinds of mistakes. We also built more analytics on the MEC. We could have used Google Analytics, but we wanted to, you know, have the same level of privacy. So we built tools like having a heat map that's computed on the MEC to hopefully improve the usability of the platform further. Okay, so we built a platform. We convinced people that MPC is, is a great solution. What else keeps this for me at least awake? And this is really a difficult question because it's more of a philosophical one than a technical one. As I mentioned before, MPC allows you to run any query, but it makes no guarantees that you can't infer from the result of that query what the data was, even though the data is supposed to be private. So some of these decisions are easy to make, right? We don't allow, or typically don't allow queries that would lose reveal single row. And we also don't allow repeated queries if the data slightly changes, right? If we have 100 participants and we perform the computation and then there's a straggler number 101, we don't allow them in the computation anymore if you already run it. So other questions are a little bit more complicated to answer. How many participants do you actually need to guarantee privacy? And what does privacy mean in this case? Well, it depends on the data that you're collecting, the query that you're running. And it's a case by case basis that we basically talk about every single time we, we perform a deployment as to what it means for, for people's data to be private. We made a decision very early on to make sure that all participants are anonymous, so we actually don't know who participated, which works well. But at the same time, the analyst actually wants to know who participated because it helps them to to encourage more people to participate, right? If you can email the single party and say, hey, I noticed that you haven't submitted your data, that would really help their numbers and make sure they have as large a collection of users um, as possible. So if we make that change in the next iteration of the platform, now we have to rethink the previous question, how many participants do you actually need? And then lastly, maybe not lastly, but lastly on the slide, which algorithms are appropriate? Some, let's say you want to do media, we say, you know, no single row results, but maybe this would be fine if your participants are anonymous. Um, at the same time, because of the makeup of the data, in our case, salary data, you might be able to identify, even if the participants are anonymous, by just looking at the row, you might be able to identify which specific company this is talking about, because they have a very, you know, very specific makeup of their C-level board, which you could infer from that result, if it so happens to be the company that you that you not. Differential privacy could be a solution here, and, and it's something that we definitely are looking into to see if we can support the combination of differential privacy and MPC. But unfortunately, for this particular use case, it doesn't look like our data maker is very well suitable for, for differential privacy, just because it would you know, mostly ruin the accuracy of, um, of the data. And then finally, maybe more for your question than for mine, all the times that we messed up. The point one I've mentioned, we, we didn't properly validate data, we want to copy paste and invalid data, so we ended up not reporting on this. The point of two worked a lot better, but we didn't do any sort of semantic validation where you could enter a, a salary for a person while at the same time saying that they worked zero months, which wasn't valid. And so we had some discrepancies in the data and, and had to report on it in that way. Um, this effort, I think we've we've learned over time that it's oftentimes better to have people off instead of trying to do this effort. If you if you suspect that people are having trouble submitting data or you know maybe they've they've generated too many error messages, at that point it's it seems to be better to completely cut them out of the computation just because the risk of having been delegated at that point is too large. And then the, the final two are kind of um, one and the same. We have definitely messed up assuming uh, wrong lower bounds, so our prime wasn't large enough and people couldn't submit. And then when we when we fixed this, or we fixed this initially by saying let's just report in thousands of dollars so that you know our data is, is a lot smaller. And then at some point we kept this for consistency sake. Someone we think it, or at least one person submitted in whole dollars when we should have submitted in thousands of dollars, so the end result was not by a factor of a thousand.
And we were able to fix these on under DC. We emailed all the participants and told them what had happened. We we coded up the, the new algorithm that obliviously would look at or obliviously work to divide by a thousand if the data was larger than a threshold that we set. And this worked, but it did leak the magnitude of the data. Um, we're still happy that that we were able to to recover under DC, which was a great use case for the platform that we built. But at the same time, you know, not necessarily uh, a limitation of NPC. We find that most of these issues result from poor planning, poor assumptions on our end, and um, just bad practices, general bad practices in software engineering. Thank you. Um, acknowledgements, obviously, this wouldn't have happened if it wasn't for a very large and dedicated team that have been working on this for many, many years. Thank you.